Yeah. Sure. You told me once about the no smoking rule that they had there. Yeah, people I told think you about no smoking. That well, would you tell the people that are listening yeah, here uh, about the no smoking? This being is a, very good. Being yeah. a completely wooden building, there was no smoking. But boy, there were chewers. <laughs> and I mean chewers. <laughs> Every post in the milling room had a <laughs> spittoon, cast iron one. That way, the cheapie. But on the third, second, third, and fourth floor, those spittoons were the old brass spittoons. Now tell, tell and I got the <laughs> tell, tell us about where they dumped the spittoons and also where the toilets went. Well, all right, I can do it. But the uh, I was walking through the aisle one day when one of the maintenance the maintenance supervisor was walking down the aisle, and he had to get rid of his tobacco. So we aimed for the spittoon. And his teeth and everything were <laughs> right into the spittoon. <laughs> and their menu was something else. It was, uh, the state made them eventually take it out. But they were a three hauler I uh, made out of Italian white marble. They were spotless, but cold, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and that was a trick. They used to oh, catch no. the, somebody in there and they would. That's how they understand about the water that came through yeah. the race, went on down underneath the building, yeah. and everything went right and into that, right out into the yeah. river. Right. And this, uh, where all this, their uh, sewage and everything went down through. But we would catch some play, somebody in there sitting there, <laughs> and light a piece of paper and wait for that water to come down through because they flush by themselves, and he would he would get it. But the uh, the water that ran the water wheel went on down and under the building, and went the entire length and then out on over First Street and into the river. And, and were, everything went in that race. I mean, the sawdust, all the sewage, everything. And you were going to tell us about the barrel racks here. Did we have a picture on the barrel racks? Yeah, the barrel racks. Yeah. Okay, this... Right. This is a picture of the old gunsmith. Somebody might be able to identify something. I, I could not identify any of them. It was taken around 1915, so uh, that was a little bit before my time. Bob, you told me that they were they contracted with a company and hired their own help. That's right. Is that right? These these would be what we would call them today group leaders, and they would contract with the uh, company for so many guns in a year. You can't do it today, but they had contracts, and they would go hire their own help, train their own help, and pay their own help. Each one, each each department head had his crew. The power crew, they had their crew. Milling machine downstairs, I understand, was strictly piecework, and you didn't get rich, but a lot of families lived out of there. I mean, it was. Enough. The wage was you had to work, but you could get by with it. Really? Yeah. And this is a, a picture of the old gunsmith, and this is a picture. This is the final assembly upstairs where the guns were put together. And am I right? Yeah. That was the final assembly. And this shows <coughs> the gun racks where they used to store the guns. In other words, each gun had a serial number. Every major part had that number on it. And you could not take the parts from one gun and put it into another one. But each, one, each major part had a, had a number. It was in a little box. When you got all done, you shouldn't have any parts left over. Now you you also told me about the dress code they had there. Do yes. you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, that was going to be some of the other guys that didn't show it. Yeah, well, they, uh, we'll have to take over for they that. They don't show it here too much. All well, they do here, they got their ties on. But those gunsmiths, when they came in in the morning, each one they were going to work in the bank, they come in with a suit, a tie, a hat, smoke for a big cigar as far as the front door. They got come in, they either had changed their clothes or some of them would put on a big white apron, 
covered right up over the back all the way around. Work all day, go home at night, and they'd be spotless with a white shirt, a suit, just like a banker. Find them pretty crass. They were, yeah. I was impressed what you told me about uh, <clears throat> wanting to go to work. This is quite unusual in today's oh, yeah, world. That's true. That they took pride in their work and they really wanted to go to work each day. And every day was a, a different thing. It wasn't something you did. You, you were responsible for putting that gun together. And if you didn't, you didn't stay. And you, your operation. And they had very, very little turnover. I mean, you know, it was, was the people took pride in their work and there was nobody coming around harassing you or pushing you and saying, you got to do this, you got to move faster, faster, and all of that. You did your work, you had so many guns to do in a day, and that was it. That's what it was thinking of. Now, maybe you could mention to them a little bit when you were producing the, the guns, how you put things together with a soft fit and a hard fit, <clears> and yeah. how some of those things would show. And so, <coughs> well, that's you mentioned some of the quality that you know, the workman had, and how you, you would fit that sound in the water table. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I was showing Rich here tonight, he says this gun is, is uh, tight. I said it's pretty much shot home because uh, when we used to fit the action, we didn't have a stock or nothing. This full wood was off the forehead, and we would have to put it on the table and hook that into that little corner of that stock, that barrel right there, and that's what got the first fitting on it. In other words, that lets you get down <clears throat> to where you could get the forehead on, and then you would drill and ream the pin. And after that, you would have to keep letting this table, this down to the water table. And we would keep it probably a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch off of the water table so that you could see right under it. <clears throat> after the gun was case hardened, then they would have to be refitted because of the warpage. And that was my last job I had was fitting the final on the action in the <clears throat> guns. So that was a hard fit, they call yeah, it. Yeah, what they call a hard fit. Yeah, then I also did uh, work repair work, putting on new barrels. Somebody wanted new barrels or new foreheads. And I it was get my day's work done. Hey, you got me right in the sights here. <laughs> yeah. Thought you was in the <laughs> Army. Did they teach you any better than that? <laughs> yeah, well, they did, but down there, we all know. You forget, don't you, right? I do. Well, you should never point a gun at a person. All right. You you also told me about this engraver uh, that he was so good oh, yeah. that even uh, that they thought maybe at some time he, he did uh, engrave money plates for the government he does, he and was. the uh, is it the uh, FBI kept the yeah they stay they, the, I've heard the government workers tell me sure. that the government came about every two or three years kept track of him, make sure he was keep track of what he was doing because <laughs> when he learned engraving. What about mm -hmm. the checkering process? That it, well, the checkering process is, uh, is this grip right here. And uh, you can you get a shot of that, the lines on it. You got it? Well, basically, there's, there's two lines. You got a line right that goes uh, about just about horizontal to the barrel. Then you've got another set of lines that's about 45 degrees to it. And you have a pattern, you scribe the outside of it where you want the pattern to go, and then you've got a little tool that's got three little prongs on it, and I think there's four, and they right follow one another. And you start, and you follow the line you, you did there, and then you come over two, and then come over two more, because you, you traced one and cut two. And that's what Joe uh, Smith used to do. They have right in the yeah. saddle, and they would have to do about uh, about ten guns a day. That's absolutely astounding. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And then they would put some oil on it. The uh, generally the stack was finished when they got it. Yeah. And then one young uh, lost the stock or lost the frame. They had to take the barrels before and start all over again. This was all thrown away. Yeah, that was all thrown away. Well, I suppose all good things could should end, but I would like to know what you think about uh, it transferred uh, your story, uh, the transfer uh, at different times of ownership of that, and finally what happened to it. Well, <clears throat> the building was part of it. 
He, they had promised to stay in Fulton. Did you tell me it was 36 inches out of plumb? It was. It was from the top of the <laughs> roof to the ground. It was out of plumb 36 inches. And all that kept it from going on over were the piping and the line shafts inside. And, and they, they, still, like they still worked it there, right? This building was constantly moving all the time. Didn't you mention that the light above yeah. when you were working in repair would come well, on? That up. floor went down. I worked on a third floor and right about, oh, 10 feet back of my bench, the floor went down 18 inches, right at that post. They had 5,000 gun stocks on the fifth floor piled right around the post. Wow. And they had milling machines, drill presses, all that stuff that they stored on that top floor. And it was just the weight of it, and the old foundations down below, they just, they just wore out, that's it. Yeah. And they did a remarkable job of saving the rest of it. Because Big Six Whitcomb was a contractor, and that roof was like a truss. And they went in and put fish plates on it. And then they run inch cables from that roof down to the first floor, and round the beam and back up again. They had turnbuckles on every floor. Right. And they had two of them down through and a man on every floor. And they just started turning those turnbuckles and they lifted that floor back up and carried it so they could get a foundation and, and uh, a new post in there. They did. They did a remarkable job. Oh, it was a remarkable company. And, you know, yeah. you, could, you could see how everything they did was through love and yeah. determination. You know? Yeah. All right, but, you uh, mentioned the fact that, that it had that heavy raptor. Let him do it. You mentioned Big Six uh, Whitcomb. I, I believe he was the same man that built uh, what we call a Whitcomb track over on the west side. Yeah, he Is was one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. okay. Yeah, he was one of them. Yeah. You well, like it, was, it was a good place to work. I mean, it, probably the best place I ever worked in, and I enjoyed it. I mean, if I get up in the morning and go in there, and, and uh, after I went to Black Cloth, it was good working, but it was a different atmosphere. There, it was just like one big family. Everybody looked out for somebody else. Somebody got a little problem or something. Somebody else knew the answer to it. We'd listen to it. Sure. For, for the people that uh, don't uh, are, aren't up on history, uh, you might explain about the old Oswego Canal, where it uh, came. Uh, it started to take an oblique turn, approximately where the Lock Three restaurant is now. Could you tell about that okay. and how it went up <laughs> by Hunter Arms? That uh, where the race used to come across the uh, plaza there. You've seen pictures of the path where the bridge was over the oh, this canal. Is now m near the uh, Marine Midland Bank, yeah. just to well, bring it up to date. Right yeah. across, yeah. it came over to what was Wall Street. There was a lock there at Wall Street. And then it went down and you had another lock at the gunworks. And then they had that basin that they used to store boats with, and in the wintertime was also part of the main, main canal. But that canal went right on down until you get to the curve on 57, you can still see the, the old stone yeah. walls down there. Uh, that is all, all Route 481 now. 481, all was but filled yeah. in as part of a WA, WPA project during the yeah. Depression. Uh, yeah, they filled that in. Yeah, you but would never know there the was a canal there now. They, they uh, blocked off the end of the canal and they diverted that water back. It still went down underneath. It went down under there before, but they were just, they weren't gates like you have today. They were just planks. And when Niagara Mohawk come in and they had to replace the planks because they had the water rights to it, they had to take all that plank out. And they'd draw the old canal right down. But if they let it fill up again, the urban renewal took away everything else. Tell us about Frank Ash's private well, generator. There, there was a, there was a, a power station right to the top of First Street. There used to be a plaza gas station there, and right behind that was a little hydro generator. The bottom of Victoria drew its water from this canal, and it used to go down through, and then, of course, it went back down through it, and the Excelsior work was down below it. And then there was another branch that went over to the Volney, felt 